going to go ahead and start with the question and answer. The way it's going to work, they have some questions they're going to answer. And depending on time, how everything's going, we may take a couple questions. We've got to split up in three categories. The first one is kind of like how they structure everything, how, it's, how they set things up. Just kind of nuts and bolts of it. Second part is going to be situational things, like how do you deal with certain situations. And then the last part is going to be more personal. How do you deal with yourself? And so, if you have a question, to, like try to fit it in one of those three categories. Don't like ask some question about how do I not commit suicide and go to the nuts and bolts student ministry. It's, it's not going to work. But uh, so that's what we're going to do. Uh, first thing, tell us about ourselves. Like us family, I know I'm not in truth for it all that. So originally, I am from small town to Ritter, Louisiana. She is from smaller town, Elton, Louisiana. Um, we met at college. Uh, that was at Magnese in Lake Charles. We got married, what year? I'm joking. We got married in 2006. <laughs> and then we moved to Shreveport. October will be five years. So we moved up to Shreveport to be the student pastor with Brother and Sister McGee. We do have three children. Um, Eight, six, and three. Yeah, Sawyer, Bentley, and Ella. Um, I am. I work full time as a payroll software sales rep. I, I sell software to different companies that are going to process payroll for their employees. And then my wife is a certified school counselor. We both, you know, we work. What do you work? Probably 50 hours or so? Long hours. She works 50 hours a week. I generally work 40, 42 hours a week. So, you know, we have full-time jobs and everything. We're not full-time anywhere, nothing like that. Um, we do live on the church property, though, so we're very close to church. So, um, free time, outdoors, shop. <laughs> Pretty standard stuff. All right. All right, so let's get into it. So, how do y'all set up y'all youth ministry? Like, how do y'all? I do this with the cameras; they can hear it. But, so how do y'all set everything up? You know, committee. Like, how do y'all structure y'all youth ministry? Sure. Um, I'll just for the first, like she said earlier, for the first four years, it was just us. Um, we were we'd been in youth ministry for. Seven years, but we strictly served on a committee. We didn't have a youth pastor. It was a group of anywhere from 10 to like 16 people, and it was figure out the best thing to do for this youth group. It was chaos, like organized chaos, but it was chaotic. And so whenever, you know, we were the head honchos, so to speak, it was we were now the student pastor. Um, we didn't have a team or anything like that. We, we used our hyphen. A lot of, we had parents at our disposal, but we didn't we didn't have anything like that. Um, and our, our hyphen group was a great help to us. Um, so basically they were like our committee. They help us do all the background stuff and um, prepare for. Um, we had we have a few, and some of them are on our staff now, our actual staff now. But they would help us um, get everything together for events and for fundraisers and things of that sort. But now... After um, in March of this year, we actually split because our we had tw ages 12 to 24 together. So it was like students who really, you know, middle schoolers can't really relate to people ready to get married. So Brother McGee uh, made a decision that we were going to split our high fed group in our junior high and high school. We're going to our middle school and high school. We're going to stay together. So when that transition happened, all high fed members that were not married had to move out and so that's where we decided brother ben and i decided that we would we wanted morley and avery rogers and um, blair and kelton pitts to be on our staff and um two totally two dynamic couples that bring two totally different things to the table but um since that time that's what we do and the way that we utilize them is brother mcgee has really encouraged us and one thing that we've done in our young people is we want to disciple our young people to lead um, and to find their own callings and, and, and serve right now at this age. So also with our couples, again, I had already mentioned that earlier, but we've started 
to give them jobs that we just did by ourselves so that they could learn the role of what they would do when they do student ministry because I believe that one day both of those couples are going to go and be student pastors somewhere else. So this is their training ground. Even though they're in a leadership position, they're training to do what we're doing later on. And so we delegate a lot of our uh, responsibilities to them. Um, not what we're supposed to do, but I'm saying we give them a role, an active role, because it's important that the young people not only be connected to Brother William and Sister Erica or for us, for to be connected to us, but we want them to be connected to their youth staff because and that was really hard for me because I am a con I like to be in control. I really do. And like at first I was like like we are not like we have to be at everything. Like this like it means like Hina, we're training and that was hard. But I I had to learn and I'm learning still that I want to help build help them to be the best leaders that they can be just like somebody gave me the opportunity to do. And so we utilize them and we delegate responsibilities and, and Ben can maybe share how we do that. Yep. Our, our pastor, uh, when you talk about the structure, he's very, um, he likes to be very detailed on how it's organized. He, have a plan, even if it's not a good plan, have a plan. But we, one thing that we, he is very, for his leaders, is he wants us to train our replacements. And what he means by that is, if if tomorrow Sister Hannah and I could not be at youth service anymore, youth service doesn't need to fall apart. Yeah. You know, the the events that we have set up and the things that we're doing, it doesn't need to fall apart if Brother Ben and Sister Hannah can't be there anymore. It needs to be able to continue. Yeah, they're going to miss us and we need a vital part, but it's not going to completely cease to exist because we're doing everything. So, you know, we worked hard to be able to delegate out those things. Um, and like Sister Hannah said, it's just an opportunity to train train those people and train them in ministry. So um, we do have, you know, like we do have six, uh, six of us now on the staff. And so it kind of kind of helps alleviate some of that. All right. So as far as those classes and new services and the off-night events, how do y'all do those? Yeah, we, we have new services every Wednesday night. Um, it's a full youth service. We don't start in the main sanctuary or anything like that. Um, we come in, we have a full worship set, music. Um, and then currently, we do not we do not have like Sunday school, so to speak. We just start main service at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings. Um, that was a decision pastor made. So a lot of our, you know, a lot of our students, obviously they get preaching on Sundays and Wednesdays. Um, but we recently had to, we kind of brainstorm. obviously we want to encourage the kids to get more into the Word, so we started a monthly Saturday Bible study, so once a month on a Saturday, they'll, we have a Bible study for the students, we give them food, everybody loves food, if yeah. you have food, they'll come, um, and then every other Thursday night, we have a recreation night, <coughs> Sorry. and what we've done there, and this like Sister Hannah said, this was hard for her, easy for me. But we delegated those out. Um, you know, uh, Blair and Kelton and Marley and Avery, they bring two totally different dynamics to the, to the youth team. Marley and Avery, they just want to help. They just want to serve. <coughs> Avery doesn't want to preach. He doesn't feel a call. He, or he hasn't acknowledged any call to preach. He doesn't want to be on the platform. He would much rather work behind the scenes, leave, do his thing, and you never mention his name. On the other hand, you have Kelton and Blair who have acknowledged a call to ministry, and they know that they're preparing for something greater in the future. So it's two totally different sets, but how do you use that? So what we did is for that Saturday monthly Bible study, obviously I could do it, but... I'm not training anybody, and it takes up uh, my Saturday. Well, I, we sat down with Kelton and Blair, and we said, this is your opportunity. You prepare a Bible study. You prepare what type of food you want to have there. You have everything ready. And then one set, that, the last Saturday of every month is that Bible study day. If something comes up, you need to move times, anything like that, you have to clear all that through us. Everything goes through us. But this is their... 
ministry their ministry opportunity. So they reach out to the kids. They let them know we're going to be, you know, covering some the twenty third Psalms this week or this month. So be studying that. When they come, those kids are there and they're ready to study. And you know, the goal for that is to have the kids reading the Bible and studying on their own and to encourage that growth. And then for our recreation nights, that's Avery and Marley's thing. Playing with the kids, getting to know the kids, setting up stuff like that. So we told them, we said, look, every other Thursday, y'all are in charge of this. We may be there, probably won't, because it's Thursday night, our kids have school, etc. So Marley and Avery, every other Thursday night, they, you know, right now we set up the core Olympics. So they took the kids, normally they would have 8 to 10, maybe 12 kids show up to write just because of different things. The first night of there, they had like 25 show up because it was something, oh man. And we saw that once we delegated that out and we said, hey, y'all can do this, that they put all their effort into it, like we said earlier, and it just, it makes it that much better. Well, and not, and I, I didn't want people to get it mixed up, though. We don't want to be a part of those events, but we also, again, want the students to connect with our youth staff, too. And so knowing that they cannot just come to us if they have a need, but that they can go to someone on the staff. And we, I have girls who only talk to me, and some, they'll, they'll, they might reach out to me once or twice, but they like talking to Blair or to Marley. And so I have to, I'm okay with that because why would we want, why would we not want to have our students connect to the body? If, and if there, there's going to be personality types that connect in different ways. You know, and so those ministry opportunities, again, are not only promoting growth for Blair and Kelton and Marley and Avery, but it's also allowing them to connect with our young people and for them to know that this is just another, this is just another part of the body that can minister to you and that can give you wisdom. And obviously, um, if there's any major problems or any major things that the young people, <coughs> excuse me, come to this the staff with they always let us know that because one thing that brother mcgee has kind of he's all oh, he hates surprises and and he's kind of like instilled that in us we need to be know what's going on and we need to make sure that we're on top of um, things like that but those are the four things that we do we obviously do lots of fundraisers and we're working on to everybody taking part of that as a staff but those are our main things that we do right now yeah the big thing obviously Obviously, it's no surprises, and this is this is kind of a maybe a small tea, and it's kind of rubbing off on me. But if I was to walk in on Sunday on Sunday morning and say, or if I was to get to church Wednesday night and come in and say, "Oh, hey, Brother McGee, by the way, I have so and so coming to preach tonight," <laughs> not going to be good. Like just. He, he may be like, okay, but then I know Thursday. And I had to learn that, you know, in the first year or so that I got there because my personality type and everything is very, like, laid back, kind of, not fly by the seat of my pants, but fly by my well-fit pants. You know, it's yeah. like, you know, I, I like to just, hey, let's, yeah, whatever, let's work it out. You know, I'll never, I'll never forget, this is a prime example, Brother McGee, we had a, a split, a sectional split rally, boys and girls, uh, at our church. Well, the girls, we always give them a sanctuary, everything's all set up for them. Well, we had the guys set up in the fellowship hall. Well, Brother McGee simply told me, set up sound. So I went and got the two speakers out of the youth room, set them on the ground, linked them together, and hooked up a corded mic to it. That's sound. <laughs> so Brother McGee gets there and he's like, where's the wireless mic? I'm like, in the U Chapel. Where's the speaker stands? In the U Chapel. Where's all this stuff? Well, you didn't tell me to get all that. So it's learning to interpret and learning yeah. those things, to what, it, what, what the pastor expects or even what Brother William expects out of that and getting in tune with that and no surprises, do everything with excellence and, and getting in that rhythm of being able to work together, that that's going to help service flow and the agendas and the structure. That's going to help all that organizers once you get on the same page. Yeah, and I think with personality types, I know that you guys, I think most of you went through the colors thing with the shocks or whatever. Like, 
our person, like I'm the, my personality is I'm more about the details, like fundraisers, things like that. I'm over that. I'm not even worried about. I tell yeah, you I know what's going on, and like, that's how it goes. But as a youth staff, those personalities. Those personality traits, the oranges, are going to have these exciting ideas. And the golds are the ones who are going to plan all those details out. And the blues are going to talk about the emotion, what appeals to the emotional side of things. And like all of our personalities work together to create this successful youth team. And so where we have to make up the difference in one another, and not just as a married couple, but in this room, we're going to make up the difference. But that's how we learn to work together because we're all a cohesive part and we all bring something really dynamic to the table and so that's important to remember all right. what's something y'all want to try with y'all student ministry maybe it's an idea that y'all haven't tried yet something that maybe brainstorm yeah we uh obviously a lot of the ideas fortunately for us over the past five years now that we have a youth staff we've been able to implement those and we're still uh fine-tuning so to speak but there are some, you know, there are some things that we're still endeavoring to do. One of them is a fall youth retreat. Uh, we have obviously in the beginning of the year, uh, you have your youth rallies, and then it goes into camp season and, and camp meeting, and then you have statewide. And, but then when you get into November, December, January, there's not a there's not a lot for the kids going on. Yeah, there are. Thanksgiving, Christmas, things, parties, but there's not like a dedicated event. And not to compare us to other states, obviously the Louisiana district is great, but for instance in Texas, every district, the North Texas, the Texaco, and the South Texas, they all have a holiday youth convention. Like that's like a huge thing over there. And so we, you know, we kind of thought about wanting to do something like that for for our youth group, obviously, but maybe for some neighboring churches or churches in the section that don't get to, maybe don't get to go to a lot of things or maybe aren't that involved to kind of bring that fellowship and that community together. That's, that is one, something that we've been pondering. Um, we also want to provide more opportunities for our young people. Um, so we do have... One thing that we are, we've always been taught, even from our church and director, um, is to build leaders and, and start working with your young people now because a lot of times nobody works with them and then they're adults and then you want to make them, they want, you want them to blossom. Well, if we start now, then we're creating leaders for the future. And so that's one thing we want to kind of expand of our opportunities because a lot of times, in student ministry, we the only thing that it's someone can do to serve is really play if they play or sing. I mean, you know, otherwise it's like, oh, well, what else can they do? Well, there's really a plethora of opportunities for the kiddos, and y'all probably do some of this already, but I, we have greeters, a greeter uh, committee that is every Wednesday night, um, and we and they pass out um reminder cards and connect they do connect cards and they're doing attendance and all of those things but it's our young ones it's our 12 year olds and our 13 year olds and our 14 year olds and then we have two boys who um they actually do play and sing too but every they alternate and after service they get all the mics and they take all the batteries out it's a way for them to get involved and a way for them to serve and so i think our goal another goal of what we want to try just to further implement more ways for students to serve. We want to build a drama team. We've done that before, but again, we, we kind of kind of dwindled down, starting that back up and just providing those opportunities for them to serve because if they can buy into their church now, they're going to be strong. There's going to be a strong foundation there. They have something to that they feel invested, and when they're invested, they're going to show up. Yeah. So. And uh, last question in this area, what do you do to involve parents and how successful is that? Fortunately for our church, we have a, a great group of parents. And in youth ministry, parents can be your greatest asset or your worst enemy. Yeah. Like it's, it truly can be just, a, there's, a, there's a, such a wide spectrum of that. And, you know, on our end, we, we have had the great parent experience. But we, we use parents as a lot of 
like for volunteer stuff for fundraisers. Like um, if we're doing a baked potato dinner, we'll ask some of the parents, can you help serve? Can you help, you know, do this, do that? As far as like your chaperoning type stuff, honestly, I try to avoid that because what young person wants to go on a church trip with their mom? <laughs> Absolutely not. Like, it's like, no thanks, dude. I'm not going. You know, we're, we're not wanting the kids to have to go, I'm with them at the house, they fuss at me, and then they get to fuss at me here. No. So I, we try to kind of avoid that. We don't really ask parents to drop. For big trips. Like, yeah. for big trips. For big trips, Youth Congress will have some go and things like that. But for the most part, we try to limit that for to, small for small things, we limit it to our staff because that's who we're wanting to promote the connection with. Because whether, they, they already have a connection with their parents. Whether good or bad, they have a connection. Yeah. And we don't want to amplify that in one way or the other. If they have a bad relationship, we don't want to make it worse. And obviously if they have a good relationship, yeah, we'd like to make it better, but we certainly don't want to make it worse. When the parents like, you need to act like they're right. Well, that's just, it's just going to create an unwelcoming atmosphere. But if we have our staff involved and the staff understands that you're making a connection, this is not about, about you being in charge of this group of kids. This is about you making a, a connection. So when they feel like they can't come talk to Brother Ben, they can go to Brother Avery or Brother Kelvin and talk to him. And because... Uh, I've even told them, and you know, at first, like Sister Anna said, it was kind of hard for her, but if that kid has a relationship with me, but he has a better relationship with Brother Kelton, that's fine by me. Because I trust Brother Kelton that he's on my staff, that he's going to relay anything super important to me, but that he's also going to be able to help that kid out. Um, as far as communicating about events and stuff, if we have major events, obviously we're going to have a meeting about that where we spell out all the details for the parents and give them everything they need to know. But one way that we have tried, uh, we've had a huge problem with parents like, hey, um, sorry my kid wasn't there tonight. They didn't. They said they didn't know about it. And I'm like, who knew about it? And, <laughs> you know, <seriously. laughs> and to kind of hit on that, because I know where she's going, we have tried everything. We've tried the monthly calendar. We've tried Facebook notifications. We've tried Instagram notifications. We've tried announcing it, making them repeat it in service. We've tried, I mean, <laughs> literally, we've tried everything. But none of that worked. Which, and we still do Instagram posts yeah. and things of that sort. But we found. So we didn't stop this. But so this is um, a result of having an effective youth staff. And by no means am I saying you guys are effective. I'm just saying this is what works for us. So one thing that Blair, she implemented for our youth is she said, I want to make little cards. Every week she does this about things going on within the week, in, within the week for our youth. And there's, she always makes them cute and they're colorful. And they have square cards. their little square cards. Like she probably makes four to a page. And she puts on there like okay youth rally vans leave at 6 30 um next next saturday out of by breakfast brunch bible study and the kids have those cards that they can give to their parents and we obviously welcome the parents to get that now i still had parents say they didn't know about something and i'm like this is going to be on youtube right yes true true story, <laughs> true story. <laughs> sure yes i get a a text from our pastor. Our pastor has a 18 year old and a 13 year old. He says, hey, are y'all taking vans to the youth rally this Friday? I'm like, yes, we're leaving at 645. He said, Tristan, who is this 13 year old? Tristan said he didn't know anything about the youth rally. <laughs> so I call, bro, I call our pastor and I say, he didn't bring the card home. Our pastor goes, what card? For the past probably six months, <laughs> for the past six months, every week we've been handing out cards and the old pastor's son has never brought one home, ever. So now what we do is on Wednesday nights when we see the parents coming to pick up their kids, we handle, we'll hand them the cards. We'll say, take an extra card. And it's just a good way for the parents to know this is what's coming up in the next week. To be able to say, okay, if I if I want to get my kid involved, this is how I get him involved. 
and, the, and most parents want their kids to be in everything, you know, because they want them to buy in to what's going on. And so that is one way that I've, I've, I've been super thankful for that little tool. And um, I know that it takes a lot of work and effort on more on my own. Blair's part, but she, that's been, it's been successful for us because the kids know. And obviously we do make announcements, but we kind of stuck to that as our main announcement tool. So. Yeah, and to kind of yeah. piggyback on that with how services are structured. I know you asked something about that earlier. The one thing we, we didn't really struggle with it because the parents were respectful, but a lot of times our youth services would run over on Wednesday nights because we started, we try to start around 7, 7.05, and then normally they're out by 8 o'clock. Well, sometimes it was 8.15, 8.30, 8.45 before, because just with the service agenda and stuff, so we kind of streamlined that a little bit because we used to, have a countdown, have a welcome, uh, play songs, play a song, then we'd have announcements, pick up an offering, uh, play another song, speaker come up, well it's like, man, the preacher's not getting up there until 7.30, 7.40, and you got 20 minutes. So what we did is we streamlined everything, all of the announcements are on the card, at the beginning of service, as soon as the countdown is over, whoever's leading service recaps that card, any quick announcements, takes up prayer requests, and when the students stand, that goes right into worship for two songs, and that way you cut down that 30 minute to 15 minutes, and the preacher can have the pulpit by 715, 720. And it kind of helps streamline and take out wasted time because y'all know as well as I do, I can tell the kids till I'm blue in the face that the kids, the vans are leaving at 645, but I'm going to get a text Friday morning, what time the vans leave? 6.45, did you not listen to your service? So, why, I'm, and I hate to say waste, but why waste that time and effort trying to communicate to them when they're not going to, we're not, they're not listening. So, make it, make it a quality time for those students when they're in your presence. And we also have a one call system, which I'll probably do as well, that right. we, we have one call where you can send messages out to your church. Well, so we use, I utilize that a lot because parents are connected and so we will send out one calls about events or whatever, what time to be there like the day before. If you, if you, you don't have a thing like that, we actually took one whole Wednesday night. We had all of our kids there and we said, we need a phone number that we can text, an email that you actually look at, something. And we made sure we have a contact list. We have probably, now after the split, we probably have 35 youth. But we have 62 contacts in our contact list. Because it's going to everything. If mom has two cell phones, mom will get two text messages. <laughs> so we, and you can send it from the phone. And so I'm sure y'all have some sort of system along that way. So it, even if it means taking a youth service or taking a Sunday morning to get that established. Because that's so convenient. I can just, I can text her, Hannah and say, send out a text reminder about this. And boom, it goes to everybody. That's short. Remind 101 is what we use for school, but that's also a great free tool. And it's the same way that the parents would sign, they would text this text message to um, a certain number, and then it would, every time y'all send a message, it would send it. It's just the same thing, but it's free. I, again, it, I don't know if y'all have any 30 questions. seconds. Oh, yep. Okay. Be good. Remind 101 is what it's called. All right, we'll go to the next, next section. Um, as far as evangelism, right, I'll be honest, one thing we struggle with is getting kids, there's some that invite people, but as far as evangelizing, actually evangelizing. What is something y'all have done, or what, and everything y'all do that seems to be successful? Obviously, if you attach any sort of incentive, whether it be financial or product driven, um, you can, like, for our Saturday brunch Bible study, we are actually going to discuss this Monday, but we're going to make a, I think we're going to call it a star card. And every time they bring a guest to a monthly Bible study, they get a gold star. And if you get three gold stars, we take you to Raising Cane's. You can cash it in for a box combo. And this is our, we have a lot of junior middle school students right now that just moved up. And so they're like, like, free food? Yeah. Yes. They, they <laughs> Remember, kids like food. food. Um, but then we've even done, uh, we've made a push for a special service and we'll start four to six weeks out and we're going to have a drawing for a pair of beats. We've done that 
we've done that. We've gained our, we, we actually had, at the time, that was our largest youth service was, was when we, you know, gave out a pair of beats. Um, and get, and just, uh, get, get your pastor to buy in. Say, hey, we're going to get some guests here. Let's put up, put an Annie in a pot with us. We're going to put up, and I'm just using round numbers, we're going to put up 50. Can the church put up 100? And hey, $150 buy a pair of beads. Um, we have... Um, as, and, and as far as encouraging... Yeah, and, and we even have what we do for that. I was, I was trying to think of... We, said, we gave a pair of beads. We had actually... In the one service, we gave away two pair of beads. And... You know, everybody's always thinking, I don't have an opportunity to, to win. But what we did is we gave one pair to the guest pool and one pair to the student pool. And the only way you could get your name in the student pool is if you brought one or two guests. So then students are like, well, wait, just because I show up, I can't get my name in the pool? Uh-uh. You have to bring somebody. And then they go, oh. <laughs> and so it kind of gets the wheels turning and they're like, because I know they ain't going to bring somebody. And if I bring somebody, <laughs> my odds are better. And so, because, you know, everybody thinks I'll have the same odds. Well, you, they think it's a level playing field. You make it uneven. You make it weighted in your your favor. So you get both at, both sides of it there. Um, as far as evangelize, getting our students to evangelize, I think, again, and I've said this a lot today, but getting your kiddos to buy in to be an active part, not just, hey, we're going to plan everything, but you just show up for outreach or whatever. Um, having them be an active part of what's going on in that makes them excited. I know this year we had our annual youth revival and we went to the boardwalk and report and our young people, we did a little worship set while we had to provide some type of entertainment while we handed out flyers or uh, for a pulse, but we sang, and so the key it wasn't just me up there singing. It was them. It was them investing in that outreach moment, and they were excited about it. Um, and we had a huge turnout for that. Yeah, and you know, providing that, and providing a fun atmosphere. And, and a lot of times in in church, you know, oh, well, church is not fun. It's not supposed to be fun. No church is supposed to be fun. Living for Jesus is fun. If it's always, and it, obviously it's serious, but if it's always super serious and you can't ever have any fun and you can't, 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 can't who, what, what, no, nobody wants to go do that. What can you do? I don't know, but I know what I can't do. It's like, wait a minute. you got to allow them to have fun. you got to allow them to, like, for the Core Olympics, for example. So, everybody, who's the youngest in here? How old are you? Fourteen. Fourteen, Okay. So, uh, uh, 14 and up is cool, but everybody knows 12 and 13 year olds are weird. Mm. <laughs> just gonna, some of them dudes are weird. And it, it's not a bad thing. They're just going through those changes in their life. So, we had the core Olympics, okay? So, we set it up, and we were going to, we, Marley and Avery said, we're going to split up the teams, make them pretty even, and we're going to allow them to make their team names. Fair. That sounds awesome. Y'all are thinking of team names right now. So we have the Staggering Seagulls, the Looney Tunes, the Better Team, and the Craig Martins. That's our old school, That's our old school principle. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> it's mostly 12, 13 year olds. Come up with some, the things that appeal to them are not going to appeal to you. But once again, it's not about what appeals to you. It's making that fun game for them. It's making that fun activity for them and getting them to say, man, I'm going to bring my 12 and 13 year old friends because they're not going to bring their 33 year old friend. That'd be weird. And they, they, birds of a feather flock together. They, they hang out with people that think like them and act like them and talk like them and that's who we're trying to reach. Obviously, I can go in and I can connect with junior high students, but I have very little in common with junior students as far as what we like and what we like to do and things like that. But those 12 and 13 year olds, when you make that fun atmosphere, for us it's at core student ministries or at image student ministries, when they go to school and they say, hey man, next week we're having a, a flag football tournament. Well, really? Yeah, come play. It's open to everybody. We're going to split the teams. We're going to get everything done. Bring a team and we're going to have fun. 
Really? Yeah, come on. Well, all of a sudden that kid that has never done anything and you thought is not paying attention, now that he has that opportunity to have fun, it actually turns into evangelism for him. And they see that big picture. They see the picture of, oh, it's not about flag football. It's about Jesus. Now you're catching on. That's what giving them that opportunity. Yeah, and creating those relationships when you bring when they bring someone in, and then they meet all these people that love. And we we're we're obviously we promote just making everybody feel included. Now we've been successful at that at all times. Probably not, but we do like when they feel that love and that acceptance from this fun thing. Then they're going to come to church, and then they're going to get that experience with God. So. All right, and this and this is another thing. One thing we struggle with is our students generally respond really good at here for altar calls. Mm -hmm. They do pretty good over there at altar calls. But as far as getting kids filled with the Holy Ghost, it's something we struggle with. Sure. Um, whenever we were prepared for this, we actually, when we got to this, we were kind of both excited because we have awesome examples about this. Um, the the big thing for us. And I said, when I say us, I say people that attend church regularly. We get comfortable and accustomed to people receiving the Holy Ghost. Now, what I mean by that is we, we get trained that, okay, this person's here. They're a guest. They don't have the Holy Ghost. They give the altar call. They walk to the front. They raise their hands. As soon as the preacher lays his hand on them, they're supposed to get the Holy Ghost. That's what we get accustomed to think that is supposed to happen. Can that happen? Yes. But the Bible says explicitly that you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It doesn't say when. It just says you will. So for us, as soon as somebody prays for them, if within 10 seconds they're not speaking in tongues, we're like, mm-hmm, sinner. That's the first thing we have. We shut down and we start, we start rationalizing in our mind why they haven't received the Holy Ghost. Here's an example. Someone that is big into exercising, lifting weights, and so forth. Once they go work out one time, they're not ready to compete on an Olympic level. Yeah, they may be stronger than they were yesterday, but they're not an Olympic athlete. What does that Olympic athlete do over the course of years of his life? And uh, I say unfortunately, but it's really not unfortunately, but sometimes it takes students days, weeks, months and in the case we've seen with the two examples that we know personally about years to receive the Holy Ghost so so how do you make that happen well we can't make it happen but you have to be consistent and you have to believe every time that person comes to the altar that this is the moment they're getting the Holy Ghost not well they didn't get it well tonight at church they're going to get it well, they didn't get it tonight. Well, Wednesday night, if they come to the altar, they're going to get it. The youth rally, they're going to get it. We had one young man in our church. Uh, I, I'm not going to go into his story, but let's just say it's, it's not the most friendly story of his life and what has happened to him. Seeking the Holy Ghost for years, years. And then finally at NAYC, he got the Holy Ghost. Amazing moment, you know, shout running. Well, there was another girl that had been seeking the Holy Ghost for years as well. And we and we were pumped, like attack hell with a water pistol. Bring it on. And we said, Shelby, tonight's your night. You're getting the Holy Ghost tonight. Literally, we stood in front of that Lucas Hole Stadium till close to 3 o'clock in the morning praying for her to get the Holy Ghost. They kicked us out of the arena and we said, you're going to get the We didn't leave. But she didn't get the Holy Ghost. We literally spent till 3 o'clock in the morning praying. There were some people that were depressed, squashed. I mean, it was like, oh man, she didn't get the Holy Ghost. She's never going to get it. It was a revival. So was it like a Wednesday night or Sunday night? It was a Sunday night. It was a Sunday night at home service. She came out the front. We had a visiting evangelist. She got the Holy Ghost. I mean, if anybody would have thought, well, she's going to get it in NAYC. That's like the Mecca of Jesus. <laughs> but it she was, and I hate to say it like this, but she wasn't prepared for it yet. She wasn't ready for it. And God just said, you shall receive the gifts of the Holy Ghost. 
So you can't get discouraged. You, can't, you have to be consistent in every opportunity, in every chance you can pursue the whole of it. Because it's a, it's a race. You're racing after that. You're trying to attain that. And I think also, you know, what Brother Ben is saying is being consistent in believing and trusting with your people. Because that is hard if they're trying to get it and they're not getting it. But just also encouraging them to open up themselves to self-reflect. and Because there's something holding them back from not releasing themselves and normally when we talk about it and pinpoint it they can tell me i remember with uh, that our one one of our young people she told me i know this is this is what i'm holding back on because i can't forgive and she knew exactly what was causing her to hold back but uh, i think also it's important that your staff understand and i mean we're still human and struggle with these elements as well but having your staff understand how to pray someone through to the Holy Ghost because a lot of times we're just like praying for them and there's no rhyme or reason you know what I'm saying and then we wonder well if we could break it back down to the basics of what because that person may not understand what's going on and obviously we know that if they are surrendered to God that God's going to fill them even if they don't understand we've seen that happen they they repented in their heart and God fills them with the Holy Ghost with one touch of the hand obviously we want that to happen but if it doesn't being consistent and encouraging them again in my opinion and that's the counselor side of me talking to self-reflect and to see what's holding me back from reaching my goal to receive the holy ghost and uh, when you when you look at those things that you allow those things to be laid down at his feet and then they can be released to receive it but uh i would again i would also encourage that you train your people that are praying that they understand the sense and if the student isn't being successful that we go back to the basics you know you're repenting repentance and we know what the motive of how to get the holiness but going back to see have they done that and have they truly been you know have they been sincere in those motives in that moment we've had we've had students even get rebaptized because they were eight nine years old when they got baptized and they didn't understand what it meant you know, they were just doing it because their parents said that's what they need to do and it washes all my sins away. But they didn't truly understand. So they got rebaptized. I don't see in the Bible where it says anything's wrong with that. But then also, you know, training your staff, like every church has these people. We all know that they're going to come up and try to put somebody in the Pentecostal submission hold. And it's like, you're like, no, 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 no. Don't let Brother Harry get a hold of them. Don't be oh, man. And you know, you shake them, and there's one person in this here. Hold on, hold on. And then another person in the other Let go, let go. And you know, the person just confused. So, being able to have your staff and be able to instruct them through this is what it takes to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and walk them through that logically, and so they can understand it and break it down, that's going to go a long ways because you have the emotional response, but when it comes down to the Holy Ghost, that is that is that heart truly opening up and, you know, letting Jesus Christ fill their soul. So that's a lot more than just a, a tear rolling down their cheek. So. I also have noticed that if they're brand new babies that have never been in the church before, seriously, with my own friends in high school that had come to church, like I had one girl come and... <laughs> I remember her like she's like physically shaking because she's so afraid because she had never experienced anything like that before, you know. And I literally stood beside her and broke it down for her, like. Especially down here, a lot of Catholic, they haven't they don't they, they ain't seen this stuff. I mean, yeah, they they stand up and down and kneel and twist and turn and <laughs> recite and all that stuff. And I mean, I'm not making fun, but they're not used to people praying and running and hollering. They're like, whoa, wait a minute. And they'll freak. They'll like. They will clam up in a heartbeat. And she, you know, because she, she's from a area where it's predominantly Catholic, and so she has a great insight into that. Yeah, and I just remember. Uh, I remember talking her through. Listen, when we lift our hands, we're just worshiping and surrender to God. And I literally explained what was happening. She's shouting because she's overcome by what the Lord's doing right now in her life, and just. Like letting them know this is a spiritual thing. Now, I'm not saying that's always going to take every fear away. But, you know, most of the time, they know they feel something. But they're like, I ain't coming back to this church after tonight. <laughs> Don't be thinking they're sitting there shaking. Oh, yeah, they're feeling the Holy Ghost. No, they ain't. They're scared out of their mind. They are scared to death. And, you know, and it, it goes a long way to walk up to them and just.
just slip your arm around them and say, are you okay? Nope. You know, <laughs> that goes a long way for that person to have someone come in and, and rather than sit back and say, mm -hmm, God's working on them. Get them, God. <laughs> we know God's a perfect gentleman. He's not going to do that to somebody. They're, they're physically scared out of their mind. So you have to be sensitive to that. Yeah. And I think, you know, you're not making an excuse. Like, we never, I never want to say we're downplaying what God's doing, but we are, we're giving them an insight of what they, what experience is actually taking place because they, they don't understand that. And not every single person like that. Some people just respond because they feel it. If they're blue, they're going to respond. But some green, some green analytical person is going to be like, well, what's really going on up in here today? You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's serious. So, it's explanation. I'm not saying you give them a play by play, but if they look like they don't understand, then kind of explain what's happening. And that from your staff and, and someone who like could actually explain it. And, and as your littles get old enough to do it, they can do it too. But that's I think that's important sometimes. Does it always change the outcome? Probably not, but it can make a difference in some some that just kind of need to know and understand what's taking place in that. I do think somebody needs to record a play-by-play -play of an offer call one day, just for the fun of it. But uh, take it upon yourself if you want to do it. We actually had a young person uh, earlier this week who was scared to death to invite her friends because they had never been in a service like that. She was asking us all kinds of questions, so we sent her a bunch of verses. And she had some of her friends last night, and I don't know if they were still scared to death or anything. But uh, they seemed to be okay after church, so there you go. All right, so uh, last question, this one. How do you get students to stick? And also, kind of piggyback on that, is students who, they're around church, but their parents don't necessarily make them come to church. Like, how do you get those students who've been around it to want to be a part of it? Sure. You know, that can be a very difficult situation because, obviously, if, if you don't have to do something, you may not do it. Like... I'm sure everyone in here at some point in time has attempted to work out and get in better shape than eat right. <laughs> well, unless, and I'm not downplaying this, unless you are, have, you're a diabetic or something like that, or you have health restrictions and they're like, you're going to die if you don't do this, most likely ice cream is going to win. The good food is going to win because... The stuff that's good for you doesn't taste like the stuff that's bad for you. So for those kids that their parents aren't making them do something, they're, they're going to resort to what they know because they don't have a vision of what it can be. If every, time, if every time you come to youth service and that student's here, and you know, because, I mean, you know your students, that that person may not be here next week, when they walk out that door, did they have an experience that makes them want to come back? Because <clears throat> as strange, and I hate to say weird, but as weird as young people that don't drive are, if they want to get somewhere, they'll find a way to get there. They are very resourceful. They can find a ride, they'll call their aunt's cousin's brother's uncle, and they will <laughs> get a ride. They will find their way to make it to church. They will text you nonstop. Are you going to pick me up? What time are you going to be here? Are you here yet? Are you on your way? Go they will find if they want to get there. But if they don't want to get there, they ain't going to answer. So it's creating that atmosphere of, hey, I want to get back to there. Now, what does that look like for y'all? Obviously, that can be a variety of different things. Is it is it a fun activity that they want to be at? Is it because we're going to have... I know the huge thing right now for kids, we're going to have a Fortnite theme type deal or, or what? It, or, well, people, you know, dude, they said Fortnite, I'm there. I don't even know what they're talking about. I just heard Fortnite, I'm going to go. So it's creating that atmosphere that the, the youth and the kids, they want to come back to. And that's, in our, in our experiences, that's what gets them to stick is their constant involvement. That it becomes a regular part of their life that when there's a youth rally, I go. Because if right now they don't go to youth rallies, well, when there's one, they're, they're not going to be worried about going because they never go to them. But if they go to three or four or five in a row, then they go, well, it's time to go to youth rally. Mm -hmm. It's time to go to youth service. Sunday is for church. 
I'm involved. I'm on the greeters team. I'm on the media team. Whatever. I want to go and be there. So it's creating that atmosphere. And I'm going to talk, talk about the relationship part because I love people and I am like, if I love you, I'm emotionally invested and I'm going to do whatever I can as staff members and as just young people who are looking to reach your community. We have to disciple people. And if you were at camp meeting um, for Brother Stan Gleason's message, uh, if, if you don't, if you haven't watched that, I'm sure he's, I know he's preached it on different occasions. This, you, you're going to have to get your hands a little bit dirty when it comes to new kiddos and getting them to stick. Um, has it, has, does it always work? Do they always stay when you do that? I'm sure there's probably examples of it not, but I'm telling you, when you love these kids and when you invest in them and when you invite them over to your home, even when it's like they're not your best friend and it's awkward and they might you may not really click in the you know in every way with them investing in them taking your time call making those follow-up calls when they're not here hey i missed you tonight um i you know reaching out and investing in them is so important you have to build a relationship if you're not one one um example that brother gleason made is it's if you had a baby any baby that your newborn baby and you said okay so you saw him, uh, you saw him that morning and said all right see you later I'll, I'll be back tonight to feed you or I'll see you later go figure out what you're gonna do tomorrow like no we have to be we got to coddle these babies they're they're brand new kiddos who don't know anything about they need our love and support just like a brand new baby they don't know how to walk in the Lord yet so that's where we're leading them and we're guiding them and building that relationship and taking out of your time to invest in them um, teaching them Bible studies even one thing that my love language is I love to cook for people and like we have a lot of outside um, we have a lot of hyphen members that are like they don't have any family in the church and some Sundays I'll, I mean it's not like every Sunday but like every couple months I'll be like hey I'm cooking for y'all seven tomorrow come to my house and eat and that's not doing anything major but it's discipling it's letting them know like you're a part of this family you're a part of who we are we don't want to do this without you and it's in those moments that we might have the best conversations about something they're struggling with and letting them know that they're not alone that there's people that care and discipling them and teaching them teaching them how to live for god because they don't know so once they learn and they learn that they have the support system of, of a staff and of a family, then they're going to stick. They're going to come back because they know who cares. And even ones that have walked away from God, it's been those that have texted me in the middle of the night whenever something's going wrong um, because they know. And I have, I have one girl right now. She started up at our church. Um, she's been connected to our church. And um, we did, we've been doing Bible studies and... God's really been dealing with her, and the past few weeks I've texted her nonstop, but she hadn't responded. And it, my person, I want to take it personal, but I know she's working out something between her and God. She's gonna have to let something go. But I know at the end of the day, when she looks back or she needs something from God, she's gonna call me. Not because I'm anything special, but because she knows the people that actually care. It's the ones that are reaching out, that are discipling, that are gonna take time out of their schedule to build that relationship and help them figure out the principles of how to live for God effectively. And so I think relationship is so important. To kind of just quick on that, you know, she she loves to cook, like she said, cook for people. And if there's someone new that comes into the church, or she'll look bottom over the house with their friends or family or several of their people their age just to kind of get to know them. Well, I'll be honest. Most of the time it's on a Sunday afternoon after morning service, and we have night service. I like to take a nap. <laughs> and very much. So I am, as I said earlier, I'm kind of an introvert. I mean, obviously I'm outgoing, but my recharge time is leave me alone. So when I have 8 to 12 people in my house that honestly, if I had it my way, I really don't want them there. But I have to realize that it's, it's not about a nap on Sunday. I can do without a nap on Sunday because this is more important. And I have to pull myself out of my comfort zone and go in there and not saying that I'm, I don't want to do it, 
But, I, but my normal routine is taking a nap. Well, you know what? I can put my normal routine aside for an afternoon. Yeah. And I can, I can help these people grow and become more attached to the church along the way. So I have to put me aside and focus on the kingdom. Man, I think, of course, I don't know if you worded it correctly, saying you don't want them there. <laughs> but basically, of course, we'd rather do our normal thing. But we have had young people that literally have no family in church. And, like, they've been, like, they've called them and, like, look, this is happening at home. We're, like, come come sleep on the couch. Sleep on our couch. Okay, sleep on our couch. Hey, I'm having this issue with my girlfriend. This, you need to remove yourself from that situation because it's unhealthy. We already told you not to do that. So come over to our house and get away. But, and I know that some, that's uncomfortable. Honestly, that's not always comfortable for me. Like, I don't, because, I mean, it just creates an awkward situation. But those kids know that if they need us, that we will be there. And so creating that relationship again, it's just they, they, they know who truly cares in the end. And that's how you're going to get people to stick in my opinion. Love is the, the best thing that you can provide for them. All right, and I do want to take a shout out right here for Trey and Lara. Trey is getting ready to start a boys' Bible study sometime pretty soon. It's in the works still, and I'm really excited about that. Take a worship. <laughs> and then Lara is getting is in the process of getting started, getting girls together to go clean some elders and shut his houses, just yeah. help them out. So I'm really excited about that. That's great. That's the kind of stuff that really helps. Yes. Yep. All right. So the last section. Um, how do you balance being a parent, spouse, and student pastor, and everything else you'll probably do at the church? We don't. Next question. <laughs> so, and that is, honestly, that's, that's probably the most difficult. Um, and this is what I said earlier when we would touch on that. Um, for the longest time, and honestly, if we're, if we're all truthful, we, th we think and we say, okay, Ministry has to come first. Everything else comes behind ministry, and if you do it any other way, you're wrong. If you do it any other way, you're not called to be a minister. You're not called to be a preacher. You may as well just give up and go sit on the pew. If ministry calls, it's first and foremost. Okay. Ministry is important. But first and foremost has to be, obviously, your relationship with God. If you're ministering or you're doing anything and you don't have a right relationship with God, no bueno. Second has to be your family. If, if I gain and I get a 400 person youth group and we're rocking and rolling, but my wife hates my guts and my kids are lost, I haven't, I haven't accomplished anything. Because I'm not doing what the Bible has set up for my household. So you have to take care of your family then comes your ministry. <clears throat> Obviously, in, in that order, but you have to take time for yourself, and you have to take time for your family, and then you have to take time for your ministry. For me, my recharge, as I'll say, is getting away, going. Um, I, me and a buddy recently, well, probably about a year ago or so, we went to Broken Bow, Oklahoma, we went camped and trout fish for three days. Literally, there's no cell phone service. I am happy. I don't, you can't get in touch with me. Now, my wife wasn't happy, but that, that's what I need. I need to get away about every six months for a day or two, just completely away, no kids, no wife, just get away. And then, unfortunately for us, if we're, if we're honest, I mean, we're very real transparent, We've neglected our family responsibility of taking time away to let our family recharge. It's been probably two years since our, our last full, like, say, a week-long vacation. And recently we took the kids over to Dallas for a couple days, but we haven't taken that full, long time off to be able to recharge, and we're actually going to do that in October. Uh, coming up in like two weeks, we're checking out and getting out of town for, I think, what, five, six, seven days, something like that. So you have to take that time to recharge because all of that is going to keep everything in balance. When you say, how do you balance it? Well, 
as humans, we can try to balance everything, but you're going to physically wear yourself out trying to do that. But if you set it up to where I have my relationship right with God and I take my time for that, I take the time for my family and I keep all that right, everything's going to balance itself out because that's how God wants it to be. He doesn't want you to be worn out, running ragged, and just like, oh my gosh, another church event. I don't know if I can do this. No, he won't. It's okay to take a rest. It's okay to be tired. Because how many of you have ever been tired? Just need a break, right? Yeah. How many of you tired right now with just like a little break? <laughs> Seems like every time you turn around, you have to. Because if you don't, you're literally going to get burnt out. I can't tell you the number of hot youth evangelists that I've seen. They come in, they're all on fire. Woo, let's go. And then when all the work starts piling on, they're like, I'm done. And they're gone. Never to return. They're out. You have to take time to recharge. You have to take time to get away. I, like, I'm, a, I'm, I'm starting to be a stickler about that. My wife, on the other hand, she's obviously very driven, very committed, very, you know, like, she doesn't want to take off from her job. But we're forcing ourselves to go, to get away, to just recharge, revamp, and come back. And that's actually going to help you in the long run. Yeah, and I just think self-care is so important. you got to take care of yourself first because, um, and we're guilty of this, and honestly, I, I'm thankful that we had this reflection because it helped us. It helps us see, yeah, you know what, we got to put things into perspective sometimes because we can give so much of ourselves <laughs> and then we're unhealthy physically. We're, we're unhealthy serving in a spiritual sense because we haven't allowed ourselves to rest. And so, you know, Making sure that you have that time to for your, for you for yourself and for your family, um, and I probably it's probably taken me a little bit longer to accept that because I felt like if I if I wanted to take a rest instead of setting up a youth event, then I was failing. You know what I'm saying? And that's not true because you want to give your best effort every time you put something forth. But that's where us as a team, being a team and buying into the team vision, that's helped us so much because. We have other people who are just as invested in the youth ministry as us, and they can do recreation, and we don't have to be in every one of those. And that's given us a time of reprieve to where we are not stressed because we know that these people are investing just as much into the kingdom and to these young people than we are. And so those are ways um, that I feel like God has provided some reprieve for us and some rest for us. And then, um, you know, just making sure that your family... You're connected to your family, and I know not, a lot, not all of you are married, but um, to the married couples or to the ones that are working towards that, make sure you take time for your spouses. And again, we struggle with that as well, but it's so important so that you can be healthy in every other aspect of your life so you can truly be motivated to give to the kingdom as you should. To kind of to kind of highlight that, to kind of hit, hit it home, and this is obviously going to, to Bill William and any of the married couples, but... This is not, you know, patting us on the back or anything, but we're, honestly, we're very busy people, my wife and I. Um, we both work full-time jobs. We have three kids. Sunday morning, I'm, I'm at the church at 7.55 for music practice. My wife is there at 8.40 for singing practice. At 9.30, singing practice is over. I have a lot of responsibilities I take care of in the, on the back end of things. Service is at 10. It's over about 12, 1230. I have to be back at church at 355 for night music practice. Obviously, we get up, take the kids to school, all of that. Monday is generally, most of the time, an off night. Um, but Tuesday night's prayer, Wednesday night's service. Thursday night, we actually have a daughter work church that very, very rarely do we have to go. But sometimes we have to go. But most of the time, that's reserved for meetings. Um, my wife... Uh, she's doing the kids program, Christmas program. So she takes the kids to Sonic Park, but she has to meet up there. Friday nights is generally youth rallies and things of that nature, youth events. And Saturdays, if it's not a youth event, we're traveling for something. Um, I also uh, I cut hair on the side, and then my wife has a clothing business. So we're very busy people. And... But if we truly wanted to do something else, we'll find time to do it. But what we ended up having to do was realize that, okay, 
if there's something else we want to do, but that, that something is nothing, we just need some blank time, well, you can find time to do that too. You just have to cut some things out that are so having to be a wreck at every other Thursday night, well, we can let our youth staff do that and that can reprieve us from that. We can actually have a rest Thursday night. Or we can have a rest this night or that night. So it, it's finding that time and identifying where you can trim that away to make more time. Now on top of that, make sure you don't trim away so much time that you're like just being lazy. Because if you're lazy, you know, obviously that ain't gonna, that's no good anyway. So it's just finding and identifying that time. All right. And last thing, how do you keep your vision fresh as far as what are you, what are you committed before? How in that perspective, in that setting, do you keep yourself your vision fresh and then also as a leader? Um, as far as the youth committee uh, side of things, as I said, that was kind of very chaotic. But it was realized that that made us realize that because none of us were the the leader, the head honcho, we were in charge. But it helped us realize that the whole goal of this has nothing to do with my ideas or your ideas. It's about touching these kids' lives and saving their souls. And if if you keep that at the, the front of mind of what is the true purpose of Image Student Ministries? Oh, to get the room filled with young people. I don't know. What's the purpose? Oh, to let everybody have fun. I don't know. What's the purpose? To to change these kids' lives and to save their soul. If you let that thought resonate through everything that you do, that's going to keep you motivated because there's always going to be kids that are lost. There's always going to be kids that are hurting that need something from God. And, and having that drive to say they're hurting and they need God, I have to find a way to make them realize that this is what they need, that's going to keep you motivated and keep that vision fresh. And I'm, I'm going to be short because I know we've been doing this for a while. But I think um, allowing, working as a staff to share new ideas because honestly, when our staff got on board, they brought things to the table that we, we saw from a different perspective. And like, again, that was hard for me because I'm a little bit of a control freak when it comes to some things. Not that I didn't think their ideas were good, but I just was like, man, you know, to hear somebody's perspective. It opened, it opened your minds to, oh, well, I didn't think of doing something that way. And their idea may be better. And so there are people that are going to bring things to the table that are better ideas than yours. And being okay with that and just working together for the betterment of your youth group and for the students in your youth group. Just um, allowing other people to impart and, and to bring fresh new things to the table is how you keep the vision exciting and the vision now it's important for our leaders to make sure that we're not trailing off and chasing an idea that's not in line with the vision but just trusting you're trusting each other and trusting everyone on the staff to that they all bring a valuable part to the table is a really important thing